On a Monday, we like to just keep abreast, keep up to date the latest agenda that's going on politically with the Australian Christian Lobby. Christopher Brough here is the ACL State Director for South Australia, Tasmania and the Northern Territory. Christopher, a special welcome back to 2020. Thanks, Neil. It's good to be back. Hi, everybody. Hey, Christopher, let's start with something that affects every single person listening to us today. If you are a Christian, if you're not concerned about this, something's wrong. This misinformation, disinformation bill described uh, even by people within the Australian Christian lobby as democracy's battle against the oncoming storm. Uh, Christopher, what's the latest with this misinformation, disinformation bill? Well, Neil, just to put listeners in the picture, the Miss Dis Bill, as we like to call it, is a dreadful piece of legislation which gives the Australian Communication and Media Authority, ACMA, a power to impose codes of conduct on, on social media platforms and, and stop what they decide is either misinformation that's unintentional wrong information or disinformation that's intentional wrong information. So that means ACMA becomes the Ministry of Truth. It decides what is truth and what can go out on social media. The problem, of course, is that that will allow them to dictate what is said between ourselves on on socials. Um, So we've been running a campaign. We had a, a, had a, a public meeting in the electorate of Greenway, which is... Minister Rowland, the relevant minister's electorate, on Saturday. We had about 200 people or or thereabouts. And uh, Michelle Pearce uh, spoke, the SCL CEO, Dan Flynn spoke. Because we want to alert people to the critical um, danger of this bill. And and this is from both a Christian and a wider community viewpoint. Many would have read articles in The Australian about this. this. this takes us into a truth control state. It wouldn't be too hard to say it's sort of a Stalinistic state where the state decides what can be can be can be aired in our media. And we we have to speak strongly against it. And we're doing that. We're encouraging people to send in submissions. Submissions close on the 20th of August. Uh, if you go to the web website www.acl.org.au you you'll see links which will enable you to send uh, to read about where you can send the submissions to uh, simply saying we don't want this in Australia we, we do not want the government to be able to say what we can say to each other uh, Christopher is there any uh, way you might feel comfortable about um, there's a couple of exemptions and <laughs> the ones who are exempt you might even be more worried about the the government and mainstream media would be exempt from the rules of this bill so uh, clearly the focus has been on social media but uh, is there any comfort at all uh, that the government is going to be exempt from uh, telling the truth and uh, and mainstream media exempt from telling the truth or at least defining the truth in the way they want to? Uh, what are your thoughts here? Well, Neil, we're from the government. We're here to help. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, no. Uh, just take the whole issue of what's in the news now about what came off came out of the Soronoff inquiry in and as a result of all the pressure the uh, ACT director of public prosecutions has resigned because of the the his conduct as found by commissioner Soronoff now if the government had control of that then those things might not be heard. Um, a little while ago, I watched uh, the movie All the President's Men, the Watergate issue, and that was because of hardworking journalists. Now, in the social media space, there, there are independent journalists, there are others who expose things, and it starts small, but then it grows. The only safety we have as a free society is the ability to speak truth unfettered. We really have to, have to, have to, have to have that. And this takes that away. So this bill aims to enable tech companies 
uh, to censor what the government perceives as problematic speech. So the government then gives some empowerment to uh, big tech companies uh, to be the ones who are enforcing what is truth. Uh, how do you think the process of all that works? Any enlightening things uh, from your side here, Christopher? Well, it, the, the, the process is the tech companies can create a code of conduct, but if the government's not happy with that, ACMA can create its own code of conduct, and that's enforceable by massive fines, like millions of dollars, a certain percentage of turnover. Now, what that's going to mean if you unpack that is this, the tech companies aren't going to take any risks. You, you don't want to take the risk of having ACMA breathing down your throat and the potential of fines. So the tech companies will self-censor. And game, that's, that's, that's game over. So it is going to have a chilling effect, a stifling effect on free communication. In the big, broad scheme of things, Christopher, in your opinion, is this a little threat to free speech or is this a big threat, what the government's discussing right now? It's a massive threat. It, it has to be because it makes the government, uh, a government department, people who aren't even answerable to us as the people by election, it makes them the arbiters of truth. Now, we know that's been happening unofficially. The Senate estimates has revealed that that um, Homeland Security sent lots and lots of requests to the social media companies during COVID to, to, to take things down, which are now shown to be true, like that the vaccines didn't help to stop transmission, like the whole source of the virus is being in all probability from the Wuhan laboratory. Those things were stopped, and yet they're true. We now know they're true. So it, it's very serious. So these, this terminology, ideological conformity, uh, you might say that all different sides of political parties in the parliament have their own ideological position, and, uh, you know, uh, one man's truth is another man's uh, mistruth or misinformation. Uh, depending on who's in power, is there going to be that sort of ability for whoever's in power to lean on uh, ACMA or lean on the big tech companies to just conform to what they want the public to be able to hear? Is that really where we're headed? Exactly. That, that's where we're headed. So uh, I come from a, a legal background. The, the whole concept of of uh, the whole philosophy of our legal system is you have, you have two strong arguments. Two arguments put strongly will reveal the truth, the absolute truth, not my truth or your truth, but what is truth. So the illustration I was given by one of my old teachers, a, a, a Supreme Court judge, was like, when you go through the Panama Canal, which is a very narrow canal, the, sh the ship's captain put the port engine, the starboard engine in opposite directions, pushing against each other, and that keeps the ship straight. That's what we need. We need frank, open, honest debate from everyone so that the truth will out. If one side, if the government side gets to call the shots, this ship of state, if you like, will, will, hit, the, will hit the edge of the canal and our society will not progress. So truth emerges out of the tension in the argument or the debate authoritarianism arises when one side uh, makes all the rules in their own favour to silence and shut down the other side. So uh, you've got to do all you can to keep both sides in the debate and uh, in the argument. Uh, if you is, is this where we're headed here, do you think, Christopher? Is there authoritarianism rising to the point where you will shut down one side of the debate, and particularly around issues that we talk about, moral issues, culture issues. Uh, is this where we're headed? That's right. That's where we're headed. If, and this is just another, is another big step along the way, and we must, we must speak against it. 
Okay, let's move on because there's lots of topics on the agenda. Let's touch on uh, New South Wales, uh, where they've got in mind similar laws to Victoria on issues like conversion therapy. And there's a consultation that's going on at the moment. Uh, What do you perceive is going on in New South Wales? So there's a consultation going on. Um, Basically, what they're proposing is to cut and paste the Victorian um, Change Suppression Act and bring it into New South Wales. That seems to be uh, what we get from the papers that have been put out. And there's a there's a invitation consultation for certain groups, uh, which I'll be attending on Thursday the 10th, I think. And then the submissions close a few days after, about the 14th. Uh, so this isn't a isn't a public consultation. Only certain groups have been invited, which is a problem in itself. The the core problem, Neil and listeners, is this, that in following the Victorian model, New South Wales has looked only at one side of the evidence. The Victorian Act came in about three years ago, and things have changed across the world in this space, particularly in the area of sex-confused kids. So the UK, Finland, Sweden, France, Norway, many states in America have now moved away from the Victorian, if you like, affirmation model, which pushes kids into sex trends, uh, uh, with puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, surgery. Britain has moved away from that. That's You can go to the NHS website and see that. That's an official statement. Uh, they're even saying social transition shouldn't be actioned um, from an early age because that leads to other things. So this well, paper yep. has, has ignored all of that, and it's remarkable in its ineptitude. Uh, it's re- ignored all of that, looked at one side of the information, and is proposing legislation. And as you say, if it's a cut and paste of what happened in Victoria, many listeners will be familiar with the uh, now very significant heavy handedness by which the government can can treat uh, any area of uh, treating someone who has an unwanted same sex attraction. And that certainly includes people who go to the church for help. And we've even discussed in times past uh, the thought that uh, even praying for someone in a prayer line may actually get you in trouble uh, in breaking the law. So the capacity here, uh, based on even what we were talking about before, who determines what's truth for an authoritarian-style government, uh, there's actually a step there towards controlling the church and what the church teaches as truth. Yes, Neil, and and it's far more... Well... It goes deeper than the church. It goes to parents. So if this legislation comes about, as in Victoria, if a parent is talking to their 14-year-old child, son, and wants to dissuade them from sexual promiscuity and does it three or four or five times, that could well be a breach of the act. If a parent wants to talk to their sex-confused daughter who is thinking of puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, which will lead to infertility and body-damaging surgery, and does it three or four times, that will be contrary to the law. It is invading the kitchen table. It is invading the rights and the obligations of parents to guide their children. It's, 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 It's impossible to overstate the wrongness of this model. All right, let's touch on very briefly. Let's. Uh, what's an update on what's happening in Western Australia? Uh, their abortion to birth laws. Uh, what's happening there, Christopher? So today's a big day in the West. The debate starts on the West Australian legislation to uh, amend the abortion laws. It's called modernisation, but it, the the gravamen of it is to bring in abortion to birth, pretty well on request. Um, It'll pass the lower house because the because the Labor Party has a super majority, and even though it's a conscience vote, most people will exercise their consciences according to what the prevailing authority in the Labor Party wants. Um, <clears throat> and then it'll go to the upper house where there's a chance of some amendments. We've been contending for 
uh, amendments to ban sex selection abortions, to uh, create a duty of care for babies born alive. We know that happens uh, after a failed abortion, to uh, allow counselling on all aspects of of dealing with an unwanted pregnancy, including retaining the baby uh, from an, the earliest opportunity and some other similar amendments. So please pray. Please pray for the parliamentarians. Um, please pray for all those in the pro-life movement as they speak and agitate. There's going to be some um, public meetings held. Dr. Joanna Howe, who is a very prominent um, proponent of the pro-life view will be speaking uh, in the West. Please be in urgent prayer for this because this would this is another step along the way to dehumanising the unborn. Uh, speaking of the unborn, uh, last week uh, you had thousands of prayer-soaked, hand-knitted baby booties that had been sent in from all around Australia and some of those listening today will have done this and they were placed on the lawns of Parliament House in Canberra. Um, give us an insight here into the developments from that, Christopher. So, Neil, this this was a, a bittersweet um, demonstration. It was sweet because of all the hard work that people across the country had done in knitting these booties and providing these booties and socks and it, it was it was lovely but it was bitter because what those booties symbolizes was the babies who's who had been born alive and left to die as a result of a failed abortion and that is a is, is a stain on our society and us i uh, uh, I listened to the evidence of a midwife um, last week who said that one baby born very young as a result of a failed abortion, or, or, or rather, that's how they do it. They, it seems that up to about 22 weeks or about 17 weeks, they induce the birth, and then the baby's born alive and left to die. And one baby was bigger than anticipated, lasted for about five hours. The midwives cuddled them. This is this is awful stuff. And and, uh, and the yeah, numbers so, the numbers, Christopher, um, more than one baby born alive every week here in Australia following an abortion, and uh, the challenge there. Uh, to get authorities to recognise that when there is a child that is born alive, even though it has been an abortion attempt, it has failed, that baby deserves care when it is outside of the womb. That's right. And, and they may not live. Some of them are born solely that they may not live. But we need to give them care. We need to have a proper system rather than loading it on the midwives who in some places in Australia now you have that process, that procedure happening in the birthing suite. So they have to go on one shift sometimes from delivering a baby and leaving it to die to delivering a baby and giving it to parents who want it. And the only difference is they're not wanted. This this is where this is a brutal situation. It is brutal, and we have to pray to God for these little ones. There is a prayer point for listeners who are listening into hearing those sobering comments about babies who are born alive. Hey, there's lots to talk about. Uh, just quickly, almost time up here, Christopher, but uh, for Tasmanian listeners, uh, papers are talking about a possible early election. Uh, a quick update on what might be happening in Tassie? Yes, yeah, so listeners will know that a few months ago, two members of the Liberal Party quit the Liberal Party and are sitting on the cross bench, Lara Alexander and John Tucker. So the Liberal Party is in minority government now. They're guaranteed to... Uh, uh, support, uh, confidence and supply. But the papers have been talking, the leader of the opposition is talking about expecting an early election or the possibility of an early election. So we have to be ready to, uh, as the ACL, uh, consistent with being a charity, we don't tell people how to vote, but we, 
we bring to the notice of people the record of of MPs on certain key issues. And one of the big issues is the Tasmanian Law Reform Institute report it, with similar laws as proposed in New South Wales or worse. And we've been arguing the case against that for over a year now. And so think about that as you as you come to vote. And um, so we need to be in prayer because the election's not due for a long time, 2026. And it would be best, I think, for the sake of the state if the government went full term. And so we need to pray that God would work his purposes out. Well, Christopher, uh, wonderful heart-to-heart insights today into what's going on in a whole lot of different dimensions. And I know listeners will be concerned about one or more of those issues we've been raising today. And I'll encourage listeners to get some more insight and detail uh, to arm yourself with the information about what is going on in your state or territory and you'll be able to get some great information at the Australian Christian Lobby website, acl.org.au. Uh, Christopher mentioned uh, there's a submission or two that you can send in to support some of those issues we've been talking about today. You'll find links on the ACL website, acl.org.au. Christopher Brough here is ACL State Director for South Australia, for Tasmania and for the Northern Territory. Christopher, thanks so much for another great update today on 2020. Thanks, Neil.